Good afternoon. Uh, happy Valentine's Day to all battery lovers. Uh, <laughs> welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Johan Blondel. I will be moderating uh, this session together with uh, Professor Boduardo. And um, my role in uh, the European Commission in DGRTD is uh, to liaise with the bat for you partnership together with my colleague Rui. Rui, stand up so that people see you. <clears throat> so the two of us are uh, forming the liaison with this new partnership on uh, batteries. But what we are going to discuss here are projects that are following from uh, the green vehicles uh, calls. So I think you are all aware that um, the Commission and Europe in general has taken the decision to phase out internal combustion engines by 2035, which means that there will be a lot of need for batteries. And we just can't use any batteries. We will need high performance, of course, because everyone wants to drive as far as possible. Uh, but we also put a lot of emphasis on having safe, reliable and long lasting batteries that are on top of that affordable for, uh, for everyone. And what is becoming more and more critical, especially in the light of uh, the recent geopolitical um, events, is the need for reliability, sorry, the need for sustainability and European autonomy. Um, so there is a lot of emphasis on the sustainability of the production of uh, the batteries, reducing the use of critical uh, raw materials. And then in the first place, I'm thinking of uh, cobalt, but also uh, graphite is one of the hidden substances inside batteries that is very critical in terms of uh, supply chain. On top of that, the circularity is, uh, is very important, so we need to prepare for recyclability of the, the batteries as well. And the production process needs to be green as much as possible. So using green energy as little as possible and reducing all of the other emissions in the course of uh, the, the production process. On top of all of that, we shouldn't forget that everything needs to be competitive because Europe has the ambition to become the second world player in terms of production of batteries by 2025. We also have the ambition to produce 69% of the batteries for local use um, locally in Europe by 2025 and 89% by 2030, which means that we will need a lot of local uh, capacity here as well. Now, the four projects that you will hear about this afternoon uh, will all contribute to these ambitions and these activities. So you will hear about new approaches uh, to reduce the dependency on critical uh, raw materials to green the production process, but also, very importantly, to understand the batteries better through modeling, because in a prediction of the behavior of the, the battery, we can make it safer, more reliable, more long lasting as well. I won't take any more of uh, the useful time of uh, the speakers and I would like to um, invite on the stage uh, Dr. Ewald, who is going to present um, Sublime. Uh, Dr. Ewald has a PhD in mechanical engineering from Aachen. Uh, he joined FEV in 2006 and he is the coordinator of Sublime. So you can use the oh, yeah. remote control just to go to the next slide, and then you need to click on the title there. Thank you. Thank you much, uh, Johan. May I say, Johan, maybe? So, yes. yeah. Thank you much for these introductory words. Yes. Uh, so, I'm also happy to be here. So, after the three years of uh, not being here, uh, able to be uh, and present results in person. So, th I think this is a great opportunity, and I, I think I would like to start right away. How much time do I have? So, 20 15 minutes. minutes? 15 Sharp. minutes. Yes. Sharp. Sharp. Okay. I will try to um, be as concise as possible and present the project. What, uh, wait a second. Ah, okay. I have to click on the name. Okay, yeah. so this was already one of the pitfalls here, but uh, now it works. Yeah, very good. I would like to present uh, the project Sublime here, which stands for solid state sulfide based lithium metal batteries for EV applications. I also have to read this because uh, the acronym is, I think, very clear. Uh, the long term sometimes is. Um, <laughs> 
a little difficult, <laughs> but okay. So um, um, it's b basically we are uh, two people at FEV who are coordinating this. That's uh, Seitoshi and uh, He's the expert uh, for the solid state uh, batteries here and um, myself. So I support him then in coordinating and in presenting these projects today. Yeah. So um, Sublime, just a very simple. What is um, the, the main objective Sublime? Um, we want to develop a lithium metal battery um, with a sulfide-based solid state electrolyte, so it's solid state, uh, which helps us then um, potentially to reach uh, the high energy capacity of uh, 450 watt hours per kilogram. Um, that means that we have to develop innovative uh, production techniques for this in order to make this happen, especially because of the specialties of that sulfide-based solid state. Um, so that would already help us uh, to establish the European um, competitive um, in battery cell production. Um, it uh, features then a low uh, cobalt um, cathode uh, active material. Also, no graphites are included. So basically, these are one of these uh, challenges um, that Sublime is addressing, um, as you has just mentioned before. And um, this project has started uh, in May 2020, so it's part of the BAT1 cluster. Uh, where other projects I think are uh, presented already last year here at this conference. But we are a little bit behind this. We started five minutes later and will be then um, according to the plan at least um, yeah, April next year. Uh, you see all the partners here, so uh, quite, quite a cross-section to all these um, European partners. So our OEMs also then are represented here from, from Port from Turkey. Um, so um, one of the other objectives, I think I mentioned already the, the high um, uh, <laughs> rank objective of the high energy capacity, especially also with the using of um, usage of, of um, um, let's say, more uncritical materials in terms of the supply chain are the two pathways. So we have a high energy and a high power density path chain. It should address low costs um, due to the fact that it's a solid state uh, electrolyte. Um, so no, no liquid electrolytes are included. Um, and we address uh, uh, the object of safe batteries, um, the sustainability, because we are using um, uh, very low cobalt um, 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 uh, cathode electrode, uh, also very high recyclability. Um, and we, um, as you can imagine, of course, um, try to address uh, <laughs> BEV applications. So um, the project itself in a nutshell, um, so what the technology is concerned you see here, basically it starts with the four steps that you see in the middle. So uh, sourcing the materials and the optimization of those ones is important, the production. So start from, from very small coin cells to upscale them at kilogram scales where we can manufacture larger pouch cells as depicted in this picture here. Uh, exemplarily, it's I think the objective of course, and then the testing will become important, especially also to prove that we uh, reach the performance and also have the inherent uh, safety there. Um, what's very important is the development um, of, the, uh, of this, in, in the upscaling of the sulfate um, um, sulfidic solid electrolyte with a very high um, ionic connectivity uh, and the corresponding development of both the positive and negative electrode. So, um, and the upscale uh, of the production of those ones. So, um, we uh, um, produce basically the, uh, the plus um, electrodes, the cathode here within the project. Um, for the negative electrode, we um, source lithium copper foils from an external supplier. I think that's important to say because uh, this is also one of the things, one of the challenges at the end of the project here, which I would uh, show to you. And all that that has to be put into a kind of a, a, a whole uh, technology package because we have to develop the cast electrodes then later for the upscaling of in pouch cells, the processing routes that all needs to be optimized that we have the right cyclability and the um, uh, and the energy density. So in order also to um, avoid um, uh, lithium dendrite formation, so m major attention is, is being paid here on the development of these protective layer strategies on the, the anode side. Um, so what we will have at the end are monolayer pouch cells of this size, one or two 10 ampere hour cells. And yeah, testing will also come and then I think next time I will be able to show more about the results here. Um, so let's start directly with the results here. We, you, you saw the techno bricks on the previous slide. Um, what uh, Sublime so far has achieved, we have uh, the uh, solid state sulfuric electrolyte. So that's an agro, um, 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 uh, agro dye type um, uh, material that we have synthesized with the uh, needed ionic connectivity um, that we need and the size distribution and the uh, purity that we want to have. So this is, this is one of the first things that we, that we had available. Um, and now we look how this then just um, 
um, uh, works together with uh, with the other technology bricks. So um, so we also have an NMC here uh, that's um, it's a low cobalt NMC NMC811, which is being optimized then to work together with our solid electrolyte, which is working well. It shows also basically on a coin cell already that we are reaching that we are coming close to the actual capacity that we are targeting at the main target. So it's, you see, it's still work in progress. is uh, is 210 million ampere per gram, but we are very already very close in seeing how this works together with our coin cells here, in um, that we use in um, supplying for the materials that we are um, come very close already to the performance here and can proceed further with the upscaling that we have enough material for the testing. Um, so this is one of the things. Then then we go further. We have seen now the electrolyte. We have seen the cathode. We work on the um, anode material, as I already um, said before, um, the anode material is being sourced outside of the project. It was not objective of sublime, also not in the cost range that we could manufacture and develop this by our own. So we used um, suppliers also from the Asian market and we're testing these. Uh, we, are, we, are doing testing, um, we are doing tests of these and we have different materials available. And this is something where we found the first challenges, for example, the first material which it in principle we need in order to really reach the very high energy densities that we are targeting at, that's uh, very thin lithium on copper, um, that uh, seems to be kind of, of low quality at the moment, that, uh, so cycling of these, these things, especially also with the development and the purification of the um, protective layers showed us that we at the moment not yet with that material are able to cycle as many times as we like. You see here these uh, these diagrams of, of charge and discharge, and you see this is, this is then at the end then very quickly um, 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 destroying the cell. If we use different kinds of materials with thicker uh, lithium, we see that our approach actually is going to work, so we can cycle quite a lot of times. Um, but however, these are thicker lithium cells, uh, thicker lithium um, and nodes, of <laughs> which um, then at the end we, we don't need because that's not much um, there is not enough active, th there is even more material than we need for active material. And that's the reason um, why we have to develop here a little bit more on, on, on this technology brick, but we see in principle that our supply approach works, but of course there is some more um, optimization needed. So um, while we are still um, further optimizing on the coin cell level, the um, electrode, um, uh, on the anode side, we can then further proceed with um, um, working towards the uh, pouch cells uh, with regards to the solid electrolyte and the um, cathode um, processing. So this is also then being done and it's working. We see already here that we are able to reach um, a very decent initial discharge capacity of that one. Um, you, you maybe you remember that I showed uh, 195 million per gram of active material before, so that's just slightly below this. So next technology, big, um, we can further optimize. So this is this is working. However, of course, because of let's say um, the um, uh, challenges that we see here on the anode side, we are using an intermediate step, um, exchanging lithium um, int intermediately against lithium indium in order to be able to continue on the optimization here. Um, and once then we have done that, then we would come back to the lithium. I will show this. So um, it needs further improvements, of course, but I think this is the way that we can do, and we are still one year ahead of us, so uh, there will be uh, still enough uh, time to do the optimization here. Um, next step is um, in terms of the parallelization of these activities between um, the cathode and the um, solid electrolyte on the one side and the anode. Um, we continue on the development of the protective layer for the anodes. So we had um, investigated um, three different approaches and um, we will then still use don those of one's um, two approaches uh, under further development. Um, you see here the SLAALD uh, method, uh, the so-called also the, in the uh, thermal evaporation technique, which we will use in order to further develop our protective layer for the anode. Maybe also we will look at um, using one of these two approaches then at a different concept, how to protect um, the dendrite formation between the anode and the solid state electrolyte. And once this is done, then we merge again with the developments of a solid state electrolyte and the cathode in the lithium metal anode at the end. So this is, this is basically the way how we want to do this. So, um, 
Now um, I would like to come basically to the um, to the conclusions of this um, of this project. We, we see the um, in terms of the mid to long term impacts. We think that um, um, of course we have some problems in order to source uh, the correct material for the anode site at the moment. So we have to use the thicker material for the lithium. That would mean that we uh, would target then with that material only first to a lower energy density. And once we have resolved the, the problems, then with the thinner and the optimized lithium copper metal anode, again, we would be able then to reach the high energy capacity. What we also see in terms of the uh, technology readiness, I think there are also some um, 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 challenges I will um, talk to later through. Um, the thing, of course, the production process still needs to be upscaled, so this is very clear. We can do this. It's, it's ongoing for the solid-state electrolyte in the um, cathode, and we will test these on one ampere um, level cells. However, um, one of the challenges is that the sourcing of the diesel material for the anode is definitely the, um, the problem here. Right now, we have to source these materials from Asia, and um, we need to have European manufacturing suppliers then, in fact, uh, so this is this is in progress. I know this, but materials also then when it comes here from European manufacturing supplies, they are really expensive still. So that needs to be upscaled then to make it more ex um, make it cheaper. Yeah. Um, so the sulfuric solid state electrolyte technology, however, needs also specifically dedicated large scale production environment. So during the um, um, production of uh, and the um, and, and the working with the solid um, state um, um, electrolyte on sulfuric basis, there is the risk of H2S formation in um, when it comes into contact with the vapor, uh, water vapor in the air. So this needs to be taken care. It's also kind of aggressive. So you would really do all these processing then in a specific environment, um, protected against um, so with a very low dew point, protected against um, the water vapor, and also. Um, course, you would not like to spoil um, your, your regular production equipment for that, uh, for that material. So this is, this is definitely something where it comes then to industry investment. So um, at the end, what would be then um, the cost comp um, impact for the supply technology? Um, we will be doing at the end of the project a quite detailed uh, recap of the uh, cost impact. So the initial estimations at the beginning of the project were you see here the numbers, how we think that they will drop down. Of course, we have to look at uh, the development of the costs for the materials again. We will revisit this then at the end, as at month um, 48, as I say, um, what the recycling path is, uh, is concerned. We already did some initial studies in which we concluded that we think that we really can recycle 90% of the materials. And another outlook beyond Sublime, uh, just here some kind of a demonstrator, how such a um, automotive applications uh, cell of, of 40 ampere hours could look like. So this was um, being designed by our partner Saft. So Saft itself, they, they are not completely in the uh, automotive business. So that's the reason why the formats might look a little bit odd. But this is in principle here how we think that a pouch cell of that size would look like. So with other partners, maybe we would have a little bit longer cells. Here you see uh, the electrode site is just a 150 millimeters times about 60 millimeters. Could also, or let's say here the pouch site, 190 times 90. Maybe we can also make it with some other materials a little bit longer. And that would, in principle, be what sublime, that would be the next steps then of sublime. Yeah. OK, so this is it. I don't know uh, how many. <laughs> was, it, was I in, in the 15 minutes still? Yeah. or? 48 seconds left. <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh, what do you want to know? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy um, to be the coordinator of this uh, project, definitely. I can say this. Uh, I came from, as I say, I'm one of the mechanical engineers that was uh, alluded to in the very beginning of the, uh, and by some coincidence, uh, yeah, I, I had the chance to coordinate this project, and I'm, I'm really happy to be part of it. I can definitely say this. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I remind you that we will be taking questions and answers in the second half of uh, the session. So please take note of your questions uh, for, uh, mm -hmm. for the second part. Okay. I would like to invite on stage now Dr. Simon Clark, who is a battery research scientist at Sintef in 
I never know how to pronounce it. Trondheim. Uh, Trondheim. Trondheim. Yeah, yeah okay. In go Norway. <laughs> old school and say Niederer, so Western Viking times. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> so before you make the same mistake than I did, you just have to go to the Hydra and double and click on it. And you will present mm -hmm. us the project Hydra. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the uh, invitation to speak today. Uh, my name is Simon Clark. Uh, I'm from Sintef in Trondheim, Norway, and the coordinator of the EU project Hydra, which is developing next generation batteries for electric vehicles. And I hope by the end of my presentation, you'll have an idea of what we're doing, uh, how we're doing it, and where we go from here. So Hydra is developing next generation batteries with a specific focus on hybrid electrodes for generation 3B lithium ion batteries. And that means high capacity silicon graphite anode blends and high voltage LNMO cathodes. We're a four year project that will go until August of 2024. So as of now, we're a little bit past halfway and we have an excellent consortium that spans uh, Europe. It includes research institutes like CENTEF, uh, universities, and industry partners. And our goal there is uh, not only to take a holistic approach developing next generation batteries, but also to provide opportunities to train the next generation of up and coming battery scientists and researchers. So we want to develop hybrid materials. We want to develop uh, hybrid electrode structures. Why? Uh, we're aiming that this should help uh, enable next generation batteries in the electric vehicles market, which means batteries with high energy density, with low cost, fast charging, and good cycle life. But we also have to be kind of smart about how we uh, approach this. We can't just get something that ticks off the technical KPIs. We also have to think about the bigger picture, right? We need to think about reducing uh, critical raw materials dependencies by uh, developing cobalt-free um, uh, electromaterials. We need to think about the environmental and ecological sustainability of batteries. Right? There's battery gigafactories popping up all over Europe now, and we need to make sure that that production is uh, sustainable. We need to enhance manufacturing processes that what we develop isn't just for one or two cells in the lab, but can actually be scaled, scaled to produce billions and billions of cells in uh, gigafactory settings. And we need to ensure fast commercial implementation of the results, right? This is a fast growing industry and we need to get results out of the lab and into the factory. So that's what we want to do. Uh, how are we going to do it? Well, uh, Hydra takes a multi-headed approach. See what we did there? <laughs> Uh, to uh, develop the next generation of, uh, of batteries. And those heads kind of focus on four main topics. One is model-based design to try to improve our understanding of what's going into the batteries and uh, get a better idea of how we can operate them for longer lifetime. Developing hybrid materials uh, that allow us to achieve higher capacities and more stable operation than is possible with uh, traditional materials. Advanced manufacturing specifically trying to move away from using uh, NMP in the cathode processing, uh, which if you're not familiar is an organic solvent that takes uh, a lot of effort to, uh, to capture and uh, can be uh, in, uh, harmful for your health and uh, flammable. So we're trying to move away from that to water-based processing. And uh, we want to improve the uh, sustainability of batteries by reducing the uh, energy uh, required to manufacture them. So, as I mentioned, we're now about halfway through the, uh, the project, and we have a few uh, results that, uh, that are interesting to highlight. Uh, the first is that we've made the first generation of uh, pouch cells in Hydra, not in coin cell format for labs, not in like small formats, but in multi-layer pouch cells, which would be um, uh, representative of what you'd actually see in, in electric vehicles. And those are currently undergoing testing uh, at the DLR. This is actually one uh, in his hand right there. Uh, we've done a public release of a powerful open source battery modeling framework to try to uh, help both scientists and engineers better understand and design their cells. Uh, we've demonstrated uh, the aqueous cathode processing uh, using water-based uh, methods instead of uh, organic solvents. And uh, we've developed standards for characterization of uh, hybrid electromaterials. 
And I would like to go through and highlight each one of these, but unfortunately we just don't have time today. So I've chosen to uh, highlight this one, our uh, open source battery modeling framework, because this is something that exists today. I'll show you a QR code. You can download it. You can use it. Uh, it's something that can be of immediate value for, uh, for the community. So our uh, modeling tool is called the Battery Modeling Toolbox, or BATMO for short. And this is an open source uh, continuum modeling framework for MATLAB and Julia. And the thing that we really excel at uh, in this uh, implementation is doing fully coupled electrochemical thermal simulations, even on very large and complex geometries like cylindrical cells. Uh, for example, what I show here is uh, an example of a 4680 uh, cylindrical cell mesh. If you follow, I'm sure you do, the EV news, uh, this is the design that Tesla is, is using in their uh, cars. And traditionally, this has been really difficult to simulate in 3D because it's a lot of cells. You have to mesh each electrode layer very finely. And uh, compared to the overall size of the battery, it can, can be uh, difficult to solve. Uh, but we've implemented a, a way to do this, and uh, for 4680 cylindrical cells, for the blade type of prismatic cells that the companies like BYD uh, favor, we can do this. And uh, it's also very fast. So uh, what we've developed is free and open source, uh, and we aim to make this not only uh, work well on its own, but to be interoperable with other tools. We work in MATLAB, we work in Julia, not everybody does. Some people like Python. And we're trying to make it possible that if you want to simulate the same uh, set of parameters in PyBAM or in CityMod or in another battery modeling framework, you can do that easily without having to do a whole lot of recoding. Uh, but also uh, a lot of battery uh, developers aren't really comfortable uh, coding at all. So we're uh, working on a web-based uh, GUI where you can uh, go in and kind of play with the sliders, play with the knobs. Uh, set up your own simulation and uh, view, view the results. So doing these kinds of simulations allow battery scientists and engineers to simulate dynamic, spatially resolved profiles for things like temperature, as we see here, uh, concentrations, electric potential and current. And for scientists, this means uh, that we can help guide battery design optimizations and do virtual testing. Uh, for engineers, you can better understand the performance of your cells under uh, different conditions. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, available now. Uh, the beta release uh, at that uh, QR code is on GitHub. And uh, currently it's uh, using a command line interface, but as I mentioned, we're developing this uh, web-based GUI for, uh, for non-developers to use as well. So uh, we've uh, also been working on trying to improve standards for uh, battery research and dissemination of data in the community. We heard earlier today, right, that uh, sharing data from research is uh, becoming a, a very important topic. Uh, but before we can do that, one thing that we, we try to focus on is improving uh, standardization and improving uh, uh, results uh, within our projects. I don't know how many people here have ever built a battery by hand. But you've probably seen some of these baking shows, right? Like the Great British Bake Off, where they give 10 bakers the same recipe, and you normally get 10 different cakes. Same kind of thing, right? Uh, in battery cell manufacturing, a lot of it is, especially on lab scale, is subject to the preferences and the prejudices of the person who built it. So at the start of the project, we did a, a round robin and saw that we had some reproducibility issues and uh, came together and wrote a set of standards for how to, uh, to build cells and how to do the characterizations. And after uh, standardization, we were able to get uh, uh, reproducible results. But uh, getting reproducible results is only one side of the coin. Uh, the other side of the coin is after, OK, we have our results, how do we share them? How do we make them available to, to people in the community? And here we're collaborating with uh, the Battery 2030 Plus uh, initiative and the project Big Map, who have done a lot of really good work on supporting uh, infrastructure for semantic data interoperability. And so in Hydra, our public data sets are following those standards uh, that allow for semantically annotated uh, data, uh, both internally within the project and externally. And our goal is that this should contribute to a ecosystem for battery data that is searchable. And what we see here in the, in the GIF is uh, being able to search not only by strings, but by semantic concepts. 
Uh, and uh, we're hoping to interfa interface this with a chat GPT-like uh, model so that you don't have to write your own Sparkle queries, you don't have to worry about you know, JSONs or turtles or owl or all these obscure file formats. You can write your query in, in chat, BT, chat GPT, it's trans, or in a chat GPT-like interface, translates it to a Sparkle query and uh, queries the knowledge graph to find data that you're interested in. So I've highlighted that we uh, have benefited from cross-project collaborations, in that case with uh, Big Map and Battery 2030, uh, especially with regards to things like standards and data and digitalization. Uh, but we're also part of the uh, LCBAT5 cluster together with the project Sense, Cobra, and 3Believe, and uh, Sense will actually be the, the next uh, talk up here today. And uh, we've been promoting joint workshops. We've had two already. Hopefully we'll have more in the future and dissemination activities. Uh, so we, we try to live up to, to our motto that teamwork makes the dream work. So finally, uh, okay, you know, why are we doing this? We, we've developed some nice modeling tools. We've talked a lot about, about uh, new battery materials. And, you know, we don't do it because it's fun, even though it is, and we don't do it because it's scientifically interesting, even though it, it is. We do it because it makes uh, business sense and it helps the industry, right? The uh, model-based design tools that we're developing lead to shorter development times, uh, longer lifetime, and uh, less scrap during the battery production process, which uh, ultimately means lower cost. Uh, hybrid materials allow us to uh, design cells and operate cells at uh, greater energy density and uh, for a longer time. And that allows us to broaden the end use uh, applications and uh, have uh, greater performance uh, uh, end uses. Our advanced manufacturing uh, methods will lower the energy requirements and that means uh, fewer materials, less waste, lower cost and greater industrial competitiveness. And uh, sustainability means uh, fewer uh, critical raw materials uh, uses and avoidance of hazardous materials and low carbon footprints. So from a technical point of view, uh, this is kind of the, the impact that we're, uh, we're targeting. And if we look at it from a more holistic approach, uh, there's a lot of benefits, you know, technical, economic, societal, all around. But what I'm, one that I really want to highlight is this one, uh, skills. We uh, are trying to, uh, to facilitate the training of new uh, battery researchers, of new battery scientists. And we have a program to do that, not only within our consortium, but also uh, students from around Europe. That's called uh, Access Hydra. And uh, if you visit our website, I'll show the, the link in a minute. Uh, if you have students uh, at your institutes or uh, early career researchers who would like to do a, a stay at uh, one of the Hydra Partner Institutes and learn a little bit more about what we're doing hands-on, then uh, we uh, offer, uh, offer uh, opportunities to do that. So you can come visit us in, in Trondheim and see the northern lights or the midnight sun, depending on what time of year you come, and uh, learn a little bit more hands-on about what we're doing in Hydra. So you can find out more at our website, h2020hydra.eu. Uh, you can uh, contact me directly. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank uh, all of our partners and especially the European Union for uh, funding our work. Uh, RTR in this case means uh, road transport research, but to me it means ready to roll. So let's, <laughs> let's do it. Thank you very much. speaker on stage, uh, Dr. Kuhn, um, who has degrees in uh, chemistry and business chemistry, um, has a PhD in the Battery done. Research Center at the University of Münster, and he is co coordinating the SENSE project, which is part of the same cluster as the one that we just heard. So, the floor is yours. If I manage to open the presentation. You All right, yeah, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to present the uh, SENSE project here today. I mean, I apologize in the beginning, my, my English is not as good as uh, that of uh, my American colleague, uh, Simon, who just uh, presented. Uh, I'm a 
a scientist at AMPA. AMPA is the, uh, Swiss, are the Swiss Federal Laboratories for Material Science and Technology. In the, in the, we are located in the Zurich area in, <coughs> in Switzerland. And uh, as Simon already mentioned, our project is also part of the LCBAT 5 uh, family of uh, projects. Here's a, a short overview of the project and the uh, consortium. So uh, we also started in 2020, slightly before the Hydra project, already in uh, February. Um, we are 11 partners uh, from uh, mostly Central Europe and also Northern Europe. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, objectives and so on, the objectives are, of course, very similar. On the cell level, we have very uh, um, ambitious ob objectives that we got from the, from the call. The energy density, 750 watt hours per liters, I think is one of the more achievable objectives. Uh, fast charging capability, because we are uh, also targeting uh, automotive applications. Uh, a reduction of critical materials of at least 20%. And I think probably the most challenging objective is really the, uh, the cycle life requirement of 2000 deep cycles. Uh, considering the cell chemistry that we are dealing with here. So generation 3B uh, basically means silicon graphite on the anode side with a relatively high silicon content of at least uh, 10%. And then on the cathode side, we decided for, to go for a nickel rich NMC. Some of the other projects rather use LNMO, for example, so a high voltage cathode material. We chose uh, nickel rich NMC also because it's quite of, of quite high interest uh, from the automotive uh, industry. Uh, in terms of um, topics that we are working on, we have quite a strong focus on uh, on uh, active materials in this in this project, so, or, or let's say in general on materials development, active materials, also uh, or, uh, safe liquid electrolytes. But as the name of our project already implies, we are also looking into sensors, in our case, uh, in-cell sensors that we are uh, implementing into, uh, into pouch cells. So here you can actually see the uh, first generation demonstrator with multiple sensors inside. And this is the cable that we use to access uh, the sensor data. Um, I think, Johan, you mentioned that in the beginning that the green uh, production is becoming also more and more important. So we are also looking into aqueous uh, electrode processing, both for the anode and the cathode. And this is quite a challenge for nickel-rich NMC, as you, as you probably uh, heard about. And then in the end, we, um, we are also integrating all the technologies we are developing in uh, multiple uh, prototypes, uh, 10 ampere hour pouch cells, two generations that incorporate the, the, the sensors that we are developing, and also uh, two generations of modules. Uh, the second module will have uh, 12 of those uh, pouch cells and a battery management system that makes use of the, uh, of the sensor data. Now I would like to highlight uh, uh, four results that so far came out of the project, starting uh, with the cathode material. So here for nickel-rich NMC, the challenge is really when you increase the nickel content, you gain in, in capacity, which is nice, and so that way you can increase the energy density. But at the same time, the material becomes less stable. For us, the starting point was uh, NMC811, so already quite a high uh, nickel content. But then we wanted to go, go beyond also in order to uh, decrease uh, the cobalt content, which is one of these uh, critical materials that, uh, that was mentioned already uh, earlier. So what we did here, and all these materials with these different compositions were synthesized with the same reactor. They all have similar properties in terms of, uh, in terms of particle size, in terms of, uh, in terms of mor morphology, in terms of surface area, which is important to be able to really compare the properties of these materials. And here in this example, we went for NMC 95.5. So we reduced the cobalt content by 50%. And as you can see here, uh, if we compare here in gray NMC 811 with NMC 95.5, this really comes as a, at a quite significant penalty in terms of cycling stability. So we are exploring, uh, or we have been exploring different approaches to improve the cycling stability, including uh, dopings and, 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 and coatings, and also uh, working on the electrolyte. And, and in this example uh, that was published uh, last year in Advanced Energy Materials, we try to substitute some of the manganese by magnesium. And what is quite interesting, when you substitute 
uh, when, you, when you put 2% magnesium inside the material, you end up with a material that has a comparable or even slightly better cycling stability here in dark blue if you compare to NMC811. Uh, slightly better cycling stability than NMC811. It's similar initial capacity. While we are reduced, reducing the cobalt content by 50%, which, which, is, which is really important, right? And uh, at the moment, we are, we are upscaling NMC materials for the second generation uh, prototype. So this is the work of our partner Z uh, ZSW that is doing the upscaling. The second example I would like to, to highlight today is, uh, is about uh, an electrolyte that we developed in the, in the project. So uh, you know uh, state-of-the-art liquid electrolytes for lithium-ion batteries are based on these uh, carbonate solvents, and especially the linear carbonates are, are highly flammable. So we were looking for strategies to uh, reduce the flammability of the electrolyte in order to uh, improve the safety of the battery. And there are, of course, multiple approaches, but, but many, many of the existing approaches come, off, come at the cost of very high viscosity meaning very low conductivity of the electrolyte, which is then detrimental for the power performance of the cell. So we explored multiple approaches in this project, and one approach that turned out to be quite successful is the use of, of flame retardants, because when we add flame retardants, we don't have to add that much, so the penalty in terms of conductivity is not that large as compared to some other approaches. And particularly this cyclotriphosphazine-based flame retardant is quite, quite promising, because we just have to add 5% to really significantly reduce the flammability of the electrolyte when combining it with a higher uh, lithium salt uh, concentration. And there were even additional benefits that we found of using this flame retard. It also um, improves the uh, wetting properties of the electrolyte. So this compound wets cell guard separators very well instantaneously, basically. And maybe most interestingly, it also helps to stabilize silicon-based anodes, which is the largest challenge of all these LCBAT5 projects, I would say, to, to stabilize these silicon materials that undergo a huge volume change during, uh, during cycling. And as you can see here, for, in that case, a silicon oxide uh, graphite anode coupled with NMC, with a high uh, NMC content uh, and high nickel content also, we can really improve the cycling stability compared to a state-of-the-art electrolyte containing 10% FEC, which is another additive that is well known to stabilize uh, uh, silicon, um, silicon anodes. We, are also, we also looked into uh, the stabilization mechanism. I cannot go into the details now, and I think the, the paper will be out maybe latest in a few months. It's under, under review at the moment. Um, Next highlight I would like to briefly uh, discuss is, I mentioned before, um, fast charging is important. And one of the bottlenecks here is really the heat that is generated. I mean, Simon already showed also the simulation results where you could see that the cells can get really hot, especially in the inside. And the larger the cell, the higher the uh, inner temperature that, uh, that uh, is reached inside the cell. And our approach here is to reduce the electrical resistance of the electrodes because that's a major contrib contributor to the heat generation uh, inside, the, inside the cell. And here we are working with the uh, company Huntsman uh, that has a, a very nice material called Mirolon Pulp that uh, is an alternative conductive additive for electrodes. And when we add this, uh, this additive in, in rather low quantities to the electrodes, around 0.5 to 1% of this material, we can significantly improve the uh, electrical as well as thermal conductivity of the electrodes. And this has kind of a dual a benefit because we are on the one hand are generating now less heat because the ohmic resistance of the electrodes is lower. So if we fast charge or discharge the, the cell, we generate less heat. And at the same time, it becomes easier to dissipate the heat using this material. And it has a quite interesting morphology. So it's a, a CNT-like, so carbon nanotube-like material that that wraps itself around the, uh, the active material particles. And, uh, and we are at the moment investigating really how the use of this uh, conductive additive uh, uh, benefits uh, the, the thermal properties of, uh, on the cell and even pack level. Um, 
the last example I would like to, to highlight today, I already mentioned that we're also working on in-cell sensors, and here uh, our partner Coventry University from the UK uh, has a lead, and they uh, published two nice uh, papers uh, in this project where they investigated multiple reference electrodes. Uh, so we are not only interested in the temperature distribution in the cell, but also in the individual electrode potentials, which is, uh, which is particularly important to learn more about the state of health of the, uh, of the silicon-based anode, and also for fast charging, because we want to avoid states of the cell where, we, uh, where it comes to lithium plating, right? Lithium plating meaning that the potential of the anode would drop below the lithium plating potential, and that's kind of the state you want to avoid. And if you have a reference electrode inside, you can really monitor the, uh, the, the electrode potentials individually for the anode and the cathode. And it turned out that both gold and titanium dioxide are, are quite promising candidates because these uh, reference electrode materials offer long-term stability in the cell and also don't require a pre-lithiation step that is needed for some other uh, reference electrode materials. And as I mentioned before, the first pouch cell uh, uh, demonstrator that we, that we produced last year incorporates uh, uh, temperature probes and also uh, titanium dioxide by a based uh, reference electrode. And at the moment, we are working on fast charging algorithms that make use of these uh, uh, sensor data. As Simon already highlight, highlighted, the, the four projects teamed up in what we call the LCBAT5 uh, cluster, which has been, I think, quite, uh, quite successful. We published a joint newsletter. Can, you can sign up for it if you're interested. Um, we, we organized multiple workshops. Last year, we organized two workshops on silicon-based batteries, one in Sweden, one in uh, Switzerland. We uh, organized joint conference sessions, for example, at the EU Green Week, the Swiss Battery Days, and the Transport Research arena, and we also teamed up to write a follow-up proposal that has been uh, funded last year, and now we have the Intelligent uh, Project, which is one of the first uh, Horizon, uh, uh, Horizon, Horizon Europe, right? Horizon Europe projects. <clears throat> yes, coming, coming to my uh, last slide, I mean, the, the, the impact of, of the project, I think one of the First, one of the most immediate impacts, of course, is really the, the training aspect that we, we, we counted a bit the student, PhD students and postdocs, and so far it has been around 15 PhD students and postdocs that have been uh, employed through the SENSE project and, and trained by the tra SENSE project. And many of those people are now uh, getting hired by different battery companies, which I think is really important, uh, important for Europe and one of the main uh, benefits of this European project. But of course, there's also a lot of learning going on at the companies. Not all companies are already, that we have in the consortium are already big players in the battery industry. So for, we can really see that uh, our project is also helping companies to enter the battery market. So they're now a step closer to enter the battery market. And I think this is also what the commission is uh, hoping for, right? Uh, uh, really, a highlight for us was was what uh, was my first highlight to 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 show that it's possible to to uh, reduce the cobalt content significantly in in these uh, nickel-rich NMC materials while maintaining a good cycling stability. This goes into the environmental factor and into Europe's dependence from uh, uh, critical um, raw materials. And uh, yeah, I already mentioned that we have this follow-up project. Think Further follow-up projects uh, are in the pipeline, and uh, we also have partners that are really uh, close to commercializing technology that we've been developing here in the project at the at the relevant scale. So that's also uh, uh, really nice. Yeah. With that, I would like to um, thank all the project partners, thank the organizers, thank the European Commission, European Union for the funding, and thank you very much for your uh, interest. Thank you. He has um, a degree. Oh, I set the timer, so you are perfectly <laughs> on time. <laughs> oh, well. Perfect.
Um, so he has a degree in uh, chemical engineering from um, EMP uh, Lorraine. Um, he joined uh, EFP Energie Nouvelle in 2012, and he is going to present us the project Modalis. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for attending this, uh, this talk. Um, so I, I will present you uh, the, the results, main results of uh, Modalis project, as stated. Uh, so for the first presentation that we had today, they are focusing on creating the materials and batteries for the next generations. But as you can, as you have been able to see, there are many, many changes that are created by these new technologies in terms of ma new materials, new behavior that needs to be, uh, to be understood. And that's uh, the main goal of the Modelist project, uh, which, so uh, this, pro this project is uh, H2020 project from LCBAT6, not LCBAT5 that we saw earlier. It began uh, January 2020 and the duration, it will last until August this year. So we are the final part of this project. And in this project, we gather a lot of uh, 10 partners from the industry for uh, ma indu uh, battery manufacturers, car manufacturers, uh, material manufacturers, as well as uh, uh, software developers with Siemens and academics. So the aim, uh, as, as we saw, there are a lot of challenges that are uh, created by the new technologies for, for, for batteries, especially for Gen 3B and Gen 4 batteries. And uh, this needs to have some new tools in order to model them and to understand the, their, uh, their behavior. So this will help uh, all uh, stakeholders from the battery industry in order to create better materials, better products. So material manufacturers will be able to evaluate, thanks to this model, the material performances into future battery cells. Battery manufacturers will be able to adapt their processes, their designs with the new materials in order to have optimized cells and make sure that they are uh, working according to the best quality that the material manufacturers have created uh, during their uh, development process. And OEM and end user will need to know how the batteries are working in order to implement them and use them correctly into their products. So in order to, uh, to answer this, uh, this need, uh, we want to create in Modelist Project a uh, modeling tool chain that will be able to tackle the new behaviors that are uh, created by this next generation batteries, generation 3B batteries, like what was presented by uh, Sense Project and Hydra by Simon and, and uh, um, sorry, <laughs> Ruben, sorry, uh, regarding especially the silicon anodes and uh, NMC, le, lo, 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 lo cobalt NMC uh, uh, positive electrodes, and especially with the silicon anodes tackling the high volumetric expansion, which will create uh, mechanical damage to the electrode and take that into account from the material to the cell or module level. And uh, for Gen 4 batteries, we are using new type of electrolytes, solid state electrolytes. So the conduction of ionic, uh, ionic conduction into this electrolyte needs to be taken into account. And then you have plenty of new interfaces to, to play with, especially solid state interface, with, uh, with the positive electrode, with the negative electrode, and inside the, the electrolyte itself. So all these new interface need to be taken into account in order to uh, understand the behavior and the challenges of this material to implement them correctly into final systems. So to do that, we are based on a multi-physics, multi-scale, multi-scale multi -scale, uh, consortium, going from the material to the prototype scale, uh, using, uh, using skills from the industry in order to better know what are the, the challenges according to industry, uh, industry partners, and also from, uh, from public research innovation actors, and also multi-physics, gathering physico-chemical characterization, mechanical behavior, thermal behavior, and uh, of course, electrical and electrochemistry. So uh, some still some mechanical engineering, but mostly <laughs> a, lot, a lot of other, uh, other skills needed for, for this. So for the main results that we, I, I would like to present to you today, we have, uh, as we as said, we are going into the last part of the project. So we, we are still six months into the project before the end of it. So we are finishing the work on the Gen 3B cells. And this led to the development of a uh, multi-scale, multi-physics tool, tool chain, going from the material with DFT modeling of silicon, silicon oxide, graphite, and also NMC, 
in order to get some uh, specific material properties at this level that are then implemented into particle scale modeling. So this is very specific uh, to our uh, application because we have very specific particles, especially for the negative electrode, with inclusion of silicon, uh, silicon into a silica uh, matrix. And this led to a specific behavior of the particles that needed to be taken into account. These particles, once they were modeled, were put into uh, an electrode, um, an, uh, sorry, uh, to an electrode scale modeling, where we could uh, we were able to study the mechanical behavior of the electrode. Then uh, this gives gave us some information how the, the electrode works in order to implement it into a full 1D cell behavior model. In this case, we are able to study the aging, safety of the battery based on the mechanical uh, properties and electrochemical properties of the material. And finally, it was implemented into a 3D model by uh, uh, Siemens in order to uh, evaluate the heterogeneity behavior, uh, of behavior into the, into the battery and uh, see whether we have some heterogeneity, especially regarding the aging of the battery. So usually when we have modeling, it's quite the easy part because when you put parameters, equation, everything together, it works. But if you want to, to, uh, to validate this, you need to have specific materials to uh, do experiments and see whether your model is relevant or not uh, with this material. So that was a very big, uh, difficult part for, for this in order to create some uh, specific batteries that are representative of future industrial batteries. So the main difficulty as future because you don't have actually then should be cells that are uh, on the on the shelf that you can buy so we had to uh, to get some material create the cells so saft created some cells that were uh, relevant for our project so it was nmc811 <coughs> silicon oxide uh, graphite cells and we wanted to have a huge impact of silicon so we aimed at 20 percent of silicon into the negative electrode so 20% was uh, a way for us to ensure that we had sufficient uh, volumetric expansion at the electrode level and see the impact of mechanical behavior on the electrode. Uh, we resulted with five ampere hour cells, so it was uh, less than expected, but <laughs> due to, to, to uh, technical challenges, it was a good uh, result to get these cells and make them work. So they were uh, put into these jigs and we created, uh, we, 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 we made a test campaign on these cells in order to evaluate the aging, the nominal behavior, of course, and the safety of the cells. So we, you can see here, for instance, uh, um, we, we did that at the level, of course. We had also specific measurements done on the material level with TM and SCM analysis to understand the the, the way the material was working into the cell and also uh, did some specific dilatometry test in order to understand what is the mechanical behavior at the electrode level with an electrochemical dilatometer and also at the cell level where a specific cell dilatometer was developed by uh, Siemens uh, CT in order to, uh, to evaluate the, to, to see the behavior of the cell during cycling. So the good thing with this cell is that it ages very fast, so we can see very fast the behavior of the cell uh, in terms of aging and get fast, faster also uh, behavior, uh, aging behavior in order to calibrate the models. So the multi-scale modeling, as I said, was done at multi-scale. First, at the molecular level, we are able to uh, get the transport and mechanical properties of the materials, especially for the NMC, the diffusion parameters of the NMC, and the mechanical properties of the silicon. Because as we bought some commercial material with silicon uh, uh, coupled with graphite, it was not possible for us to separate silicon and graphite and, and uh, analyze them separately. So we had to uh, guess the material behavior from, uh, from DFT, calcul DFT calculations. Then uh, at, the s uh, at the particle scale, as I said, we had realistic behavior of the particles and we were able to compute the stress generated into the particles due to the swelling of the materials. And of course, the swelling of the particles, as we can see here, uh, were also evaluated thanks to this uh, uh, FEM simulation. At the electrode level, we did a mechanical behavior of the electrode thanks to district discrete element modeling, as we see here. So the, the aim of this modeling is to see 
uh, what was the swelling of the of the of the electrode into uh, during uh, during cycling, and also uh, monitor the bond damages in order to evaluate how much mat active material was lost during cycling due to uh, mechanical failure. And finally, at cell level, the cell normal behavior including safety was uh, uh, evaluated thanks to the models and also thanks to uh, uh, using uh, Siemens uh, Sim Center tools, we are able to do also a 3D uh, modeling of the cell in order to monitor the heterogeneities. So once we uh, finish this first tool chain at the Gen 3B, we switch directly to Gen 4, just uh, not to be too, be too much bored with, uh, with our results. And we uh, did the same kind of approach with, uh, with the material from Gen, uh, Gen 4 batteries. First, with uh, uh, ab initio modeling, we focused on the behavior of electrolytes in order to evaluate the conductivity of these electrolytes as well as the behavior of the interface, especially focusing on lithium-indium electrolyte interface. Then we, uh, we switch to uh, mesoscopic behavior in order to understand the behavior of electrodes. On one side, the NMC solid electrolyte uh, behavior with the positive solid electrolyte interface, and at the negative, the negative solid electrolyte interface with spe specifically uh, phase field modeling in order to understand uh, dendritic growth at the negative uh, interface. <laughs> then, uh, using 1D simulation, we wanted to uh, evaluate the behavior of several types of uh, elect uh, solid electrolytes on the behavior, check whether the models we used for liquid uh, uh, ionic conductivity were still valid for solid ionic conductivity, and also implement the uh, influence of uh, pressure on the overvoltage in the cell. And finally, uh, even though we will not have some uh, experimental uh, push cell in our project, we will upscale the behavior that we, uh, we will monitor, we will see on, um, on pressure cell up to 3D push cell in order to evaluate the behavior of this, uh, of this large scale cell and see the, the main challenges that are, we, we will face when we want to, to create real, uh, real push cell of uh, high uh, ampere hour, with a, a high number of ampere hour. So as for Gen 3B, we have a dedicated cell characterization for Gen 4 using pressure cell. So the, the reference material we use is argyrodite. We will have three types of argyrodite, a nominal one that we are using uh, currently, then a second one with a smaller granul uh, granulometry, and a, a third one with better performances in order to, uh, for, for our colleagues from uh, DFT and Abidicio calculation, to, to see whether they are able to, mo to, to simulate the change in electrolyte formulation with their models and understand the, the new behavior that we can monitor uh, experimentally. Finally, uh, we have complete, uh, we have built, uh, we served complete cell uh, in order to uh, study the, the whole system together with NMC811, argyrodite and lithium indium, and also symmetric cell in order to specifically study the, be the behavior of the uh, uh, negative electrolyte, uh, electrolyte interface. So the mid uh, to long term expected impact is to help uh, the stakeholders with uh, new knowledge on the behavior of next generation batteries in order for uh, uh, material manufacturers to uh, help uh, to, to sell the material and to uh, show the benefits of the material at the full system level. Then uh, for cell manufacturers, assess the new generation cell performances in uh, new uh, material uh, performances into cells and optimize their design in order to make sure that they are used properly and are able to be, uh, to be optimized at the cell level. And finally for OEM, make sure that they are able to correctly use the new cells and the next generations into their systems, especially when we have a lot of uh, effect due to the mechanical properties, make sure that the mechanical design of the, ba the battery pack or module are fit with the new uh, battery behavior. So finally, uh, we will be able to optimize the cell development all along the value chain from manufacture, material manufacturer to OEM and better integrate the material into, uh, into cell for uh, accounting for the relevant properties, the material properties, the design properties, and also the numerical properties. 
Uh, these new tools are relevant for the next generation batteries, especially Gen 3B with high silicon content, which uh, could come into the market in 2025, and Gen 4 batteries with silicon electrolyte, which could come to market in 2030. So thank you uh, for your interest. Now it's time for the oh, sorry Q and A session. I just uh, uh, ask you to speak in the microphone that I guess it will be provided because uh, there are also people that are attending online, so it's very important that they can uh, follow the the questions. Uh, when you just introduce yourself with a name, your name and affiliation, and uh, please tell to at which project is addressed your question, and. Uh, Please, <laughs> the floor is open for any question you can have. I guess uh, there will be many questions because the projects were very interested and the presentation was very high level. So please, Wouter first, because <laughs> the uh, only one raising his hands <laughs> to start. Don't be shy. Um, Thank you, Wouter. So uh, hello, my name is Wouter Eisenmans. I'm the uh, executive director of BEPA, so the private side counterpart of uh, Johan in the Bet for EU partnership. Um, so very interested in the results of the of the project here, and there are many uh, many good ones. Um, just one remark for Simon. Uh, I saw you saw had some really good project cross project collaboration. If you could rename them synergies, that would be easier to find when the Commission does Control F in the in the in the search results. Um, but for all of them, I was really also impressed how forward looking your projects were uh, in terms of upscaling and and and, and making. Uh, I I already industrial prototypes are thinking about them or either thinking about future projects, uh, uh, what Ruben was saying. So do you have some, some lessons to share there? Because you're all sort of seeing the finish line, like how you will put this uh, results forward into, into next projects. Are you looking for commercial exploitation or for new research projects? What's your approach on this? Just for uh, all of them. Okay. So you want to start in the order you spoke, maybe? Just to answer, maybe. Oh, does it work now? So, ah, okay, I, I have to press the button, yes. I think uh, it came out clear out of my presentation that um, once we have the technology ready, we really have to see how uh, that we upscale uh, the materials further uh, towards commercial processing. I, I would say yes, definitely, we would be looking that forward to f uh, further research projects, but also uh, you know, let's say um, uh, collaborate together with partners who really want to um, develop and, and do the invest into the production machinery. Yep. Um, from uh, from our point of view, from the the point of view of the modeling uh, tools that I, I showed, uh, I think we've we've embraced uh, using open source uh, and open data uh, approaches. Uh, partly because you know it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to reinvent the wheel if uh, in every project every every model is redeveloped every time that's a lot of, of wasted uh, effort and so by contributing to, to kind of common standards we can build up uh, a uh, robust foundation and uh, you know raise the level of science across the board and provide a, a common platform for industry to build on Yeah, what I would maybe just add to what you already said is that there might also be the opportunity for some smaller bilateral projects or trilateral trilateral projects to really have help specific partners to bring their technologies to market. But uh, yeah, we are also very much looking forward to large follow up projects with the intelligent project being one example of those follow-up projects. I think next year there's going to be another call on Generation 3B batteries. And I'm pretty sure that some of the uh, coordinators of the <laughs> ELSIBAT 5 uh, projects have also plans to uh, contribute to that plan. So yeah, we are, we are very happy with the, with the current uh, funding landscape, let's say, in Europe. I mean, I think it's quite rich. It's probably not going to stay like this for forever, but at the moment, uh, uh, it's very good. Thank you. <coughs> yes, sir. Re regarding more specifically modeling, the we, we, we feel that uh, at each time we, we create, uh, we, we go to another subject, we just scratch the surface because there are so many things to, uh, to study, as you said, some more specific projects are, 
are still ongoing because when you look at the materials, there are specific behavior that you need to take into account. So you need to study specifically the material that you want to study to, to, to implement. Uh, at the, you, had, you need to build it, you need to study it, you need to model it, you need to integrate it. So it's, it's have many things to be done. And, and for follow-up projects, when we look at modeling, for instance, you, you can do modeling at each scale. If you want to design material, if you want to design batteries, if you want to design mater uh, manufacturing material, if you want to uh, integrate the batteries and so on. A and that's a new scope every time, a new, uh, a new scope for modeling, for, for choosing the hypothesis that you want to do and so on. And, uh, and yeah, it's a lot of work to, to be done still now for, for these uh, technologies. Thank you for the questions. So please, uh, Anwar, here in the, thank you, on the other side. <laughs> Great. Yeah, uh, thank you for g great presentation. So my name is Anwar Anjas. I'm um, a researcher at RISE, Sweden. Uh, one of the uh, thing actually quite interesting is that uh, Simon, you presented a very nice uh, collaboration between the old uh, project that is funded on the same co, and synergy seems to be very good. So I would like to ask you. Uh, experience uh, like um, how do you uh, manage to collaborate between the those projects because I'm also coordinating two project European project Palestine and Norwalk and we we are struggling a little bit to figure out the framework how we should collaborate it will be very nice if you can tell us a little bit like what kind of agreement between the part project you have and how how you manage to collaborate. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so as, as uh, Ruben and I both uh, highlighted, we've been uh, having common workshops on uh, topics that are at least scientifically of, of interest. And uh, one of the, the big challenges in Generation 3B batteries is uh, silicon graphite uh, anode composites. As it was shown, you know, silicon expands. It tends to tear up your electrodes. And uh, from a scientific point of view, there's a lot of, of benefit that can be had from uh, exchanging experiences, uh, adhering to common standards so that when Sense publishes data and Hydra publishes data, that it's actually uh, comparable, that we don't lose, lose things in apples and oranges comparison. Uh, so on, on the one hand, there's, we, we can benefit a lot from scientific uh, discussions. But on the other hand, of course, uh, we're working with, uh, with industry. The goal is to build a, a European industry, and there's a lot of confidential IP. So uh, that's you know, one of the, the challenges that we face is we, we want to be open, but you can only be open to a, to a point. Um, but I, I think we've we found a, a good way to, to walk that, uh, that line. No. Would you like to, to say a few words? Yeah, I mean, just to, to add to that, uh, I think it becomes easier over time, in the beginning, nothing is really in the public domain, right? Nothing is published, but if you're in the third or fourth year, papers really start to come out, right? And then it becomes, <coughs> ah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think because I opened the, the door, so maybe in the back it's a bit difficult to hear. Okay, I will try to get closer to the microphone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the cable is quite short. <laughs> okay, can make okay, it okay, happen. Uh, Don't worry. So I think it's becoming easier easier with time and maybe one other aspect that I would like to highlight is also easier if you have a partner that might have some professional help for the dissemination activities. So actually the COBRA project has a bit of the lead in our um, joint cluster activities because also they have a, a company that they're working with that are, is taking care of, of all the uh, outreach activities, let's say. So I think there we have some uh, professional help and also a bit more, uh, uh, let's say, person power uh, in that regard. And maybe also they have more experience with putting together newsletters, for example, which was for us quite a, quite a new thing. So that's maybe also a recommendation uh, to, to look maybe for a project that has such, a, such expertise in the consortium, if possible. But I think it's highly encouraged by the uh, European Commission to, to cluster up and uh, our experience has been really, uh, really great. I mean, it's also a great networking opportunity. I mean, the, the projects are already quite large, the consortia, but then you're really talking about maybe around 40 different uh, partners 
coming together. So uh, yeah, it really enhances uh, the the networking and uh, yeah, it has been great fun also to to meet uh, people from the other projects. <laughs> well, I think um, very clear. We are just coming out of the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, so I think all of our projects here basically have started in the middle, in the midst of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I mean, it's, it's always the same thing. Yeah, you, you are not able to meet face to face. Uh, so uh, for, for the partners who have not known each other before, that's always the case. Yeah, somebody, you know, some, some of the big buddies, they are writing the proposals. Yeah, so the proposals and finally granted, you take your young PhD students, of course, who say, you know, please do the job. And um, OK, they, they are just, uh, you know, let's say thrown into the cold water. Um, so and then they have to establish uh, their network then uh, while, you know, the big the big bosses basically they already had it uh, but those ones who actually have to do the work then and have to talk to each other then all the time they don't see each other and i think this is something where we had to do uh, you know kind of lessons learned on that uh, so for all of us it was kind of new just to start in let's say just this virtual environment i think this is one of the things um where, where we really can say, okay, we have to learn still to how to do this. And I, I mean, it's a main contributor, basically, how you overcome these things if you have some kind of consortia that already, uh, you know, were well established before, maybe if there had been previous projects. Uh, and, um, you know, then they continue basically on, 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 on these uh, initial connections. That's going to be working fine. But of course, if you are not able to do... Um, you know, your general assembly meetings face to face, uh, then you're missing lots of the communication that was done. But OK, uh, time is over. I think um, now, now we are happy to be here. Uh, and I really can say also for Sublime, it was, you know, an eye opener, at, uh, you know, one year ago when we really had our first to face, uh, first face to face mission and uh, lots of the, you know, the communication, which was just uh, among small people, then it started to be growing. and. Um, I think that that definitely helps, yeah. So, so hopefully we will not be having the same situation again. But I would think that next time when it would happen again, uh, we will be better prepared anyway. So we have learned quite a lot of things. But uh, there is nothing to be uh, beaten by a face-to-face -face meeting uh, and uh, you know the uh, you know the, the physical exchange because that really um, brings the trust to the people and the open communication at the end. Thank you. There's a question from Emma for Sue. Thank you. Emma Boyak from uh, Green Innovation. Um, thank you very much for your presentation and overviews. Um, I haven't seen, I have seen qualitative uh, indication regarding uh, uh, impact, CO2 impact, impact. but uh, are you doing some assessment, uh, LCA assessment for your technologies because at uh, when it comes to application in cars in vehicles uh, it will be a, a means to discard or to accept a technology and it's very important this is first question second one uh, i have seen unless i have missed uh, some indication about trl level i have seen in one uh, one project indicated it, IDRA, uh, TRL6, but I haven't seen for the others. It would be possible to know it if uh, it's uh, done. And the uh, last question is regarding <laughs> the cost. I have seen in the first presentation, Sublime, uh, uh, indication regarding cost uh, and the cost uh, towards 2030 is 57, uh, 75 euro uh, per kilowatt hour. And uh, is it a target or it is uh, reachable? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, maybe maybe I will start with Sublime. So first of all, Sublime is also targeting for TR uh, L level six. Um, that's 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 the true. I think that was also part of the call anyway. Um, secondly, uh, life cycle analysis. Um, so since we are still evolving the uh, technology in detail, it was already anyway planned to, to perform this life cycle analysis until the end of the pr uh, project. So that's still uh, we are in uh, I don't know. Uh, we are in month uh, 34, I think. So that means uh, we are still, let's say, 12, 14 months to go for that. Um, I think that it's going to be clear. And also, um, due to the volatile uh, you know, uh, <laughs> cost development of, of the materials, also, um, but the actual cost impact is going to you know, be concerned. It, it comes all after we have really optimized uh, for the upscale 
uh, materials than um, our concept that we can come up with a, with a new cost estimation. So um, I would like to beg you a little bit for my patience until the end of the project. Yeah. Yep, and uh, yeah, so it seems like mechanical engineers are having a moment today, so I'm going to take a chance and fly my flag that uh, <laughs> originally I was a mechanical engineer before I moved to the battery industry. Yeah. Uh, so I, I tend to, to look at things as a, a kind of very problem, problem solution kind of engineer's mindset. And uh, in, in Hydra, when we target these, uh, this cost uh, of the cell and, you know, how are we going to achieve it? Uh, one of our uh, tasks was to sit down and say, okay, we want to do silicon graphite, we want to do LNMO, we want to do these manufacturing things. Which of those things are going to contribute most to getting us towards the, the cost target? And uh, what we found is that by far and wide, it's the aqueous processing of the LNMO uh, cathode material. Uh, and uh, we've done a, a techno-economic uh, LCA uh, assessment and trying to, uh, to quantify, you know, how, uh, how much that can, that can contribute. So uh, we're trying to develop that uh, further to, uh, to uh, hit our, our overall cost, cost target. And uh, as part of a, a separate project, we were doing a, a look at battery manufacturing more generally and saying, you know, in, in the scope of what's planned for Europe, uh, what type of improvements do we need to make in order to, to have a difference? And what we found is that even if you can reduce the scrap rate at a gigafactory by just 1%, that scales to hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, it's, it's really incredible. So even small um, uh, improvements can make a difference, and we're, we're trying to be smart about what we target in, in the right order and the right way. Yeah, in, in terms of TRL, same, six, level six, also came out of the call. I think level six basically means demonstration in a relevant environment, right? That's why we are also developing the module. And actually, our module partner is even here in the audience, uh, FPT. <laughs> um, which poses additional challenges, right? Um, in, in terms of cost, there was also a target. I didn't mention that because I talked more about the cell level objectives, but there was a pack level target, I think, of 90 euros per kilowatt hour, which seems quite ambitious, especially on the pack level. Uh, I think the raw material cost, I mean, you, you mentioned that, uh, Jens, went up a lot uh, recently. Um, but we've been doing a cost and scalability analysis, I mean, multiple iterations, actually, during the lifetime of the project. and. I think our current estimate is that we are slightly above the cost target, but not, not like miles away, because the technology that we are working on is relatively close to the current state of the art. I mean, we're just adding silicon to the anode, and uh, the NMC has a higher nickel content, which actually lowers costs, right? Cobalt is particularly expensive, nickel is a bit cheaper. I mean, there have been some uh, fluctuations in the price recently, but I think that's a general, uh, general tendency. And uh, also on the electrolyte side, as we are still working mainly with a carbonate-based electrolyte, and we're just playing with the with additives. Also here, we don't see a huge uh, change in cost. What is probably quite expensive, and I don't know, I'm not sure if that will really ever make it to uh, commercial cells, is to really put sensors inside the cells. I mean, that requires additional manufacturing steps and uh, probably is a bit cost prohibitive. Maybe with the exception of certain uh, applications that require the highest level of safety, for example, but maybe not for mass market applications. So I think you really have to look at the te uh, technologies one by one and, and, and see which one uh, can be upscaled uh, cost effectively. And, um, and of course, we're also taking environmental factors into account, as I mentioned. Uh, I mentioned the cobalt before, but also graphite, natural graphite, I think is on the list of the critical raw materials. And if you go from graphite to silicon graphite with a relatively high silicon content, you can also significantly reduce a graphite, uh, graphite uh, amount uh, inside the cell, which I think is also um, a benefit from, uh, from that point of view. Yeah, I think that would be a sense, a sense perspective. For, for, the, for the modeling part, uh, I think that the issue is quite different, especially regarding the TRL and so on, because 
we, we, we are quite, we need to, to have the, the, the technology in order to make sure that we are modeling the right thing in the, in the end. But uh, we need to, to be ready for the next technology. That's the, the whole point of the Malays project, to make sure that what we describe uh, is representative of the next technology, so silicon, but other material was also high volumetric expansion or high volumetric or mechanical aspects like uh, sulfur and something like that. And uh, so it, it will create some basics for the next development. And so there, there will be, a, it's a, a, a first demonstrator, a technology that we, we can test and validate. And then we will be able to, 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 uh, to use it for other technologies in order to make sure that uh, that these new technologies like titium sulfur or other other intermetallic alloys are still valid for the next uh, the next generation of batteries. Just a very small uh, addition in the work program 2122. We also had a joint topic between bat for you and two zero, specifically on uh, on life cycle uh, analysis. So this aspect is also being covered from the two sides, the batteries and the vehicles. And then uh, we also have um, a topic in the call, the second part of Batteries 23 that is opening in May on the battery passport. And of course, the CO2 footprint uh, is also going to be part of, uh, of that. Thank you for complimenting. There was a question in the sixth row. Please, thank you. Hello, hi. This is uh, Karim Hassan from the Catalan Agency for Businesses. I have a question for uh, Dr. Petit and the Modalis project. Um, the first one is, how will the toolbox look once it's mature, so to say? Will it be 100% open and will just anybody be able to access the model, the data, and so on? And the second one is, um, how are the models kind of like communicating? Or are you just layering them to give a more global picture because DFT is not thermodynamics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's that's interesting. If you could build on that, thank you. So yeah, the the main issue with the with the multi scale is that we don't have only a multi scale behavior, but a multi temporal uh, behavior. When you are using DFT, you are picos count something like that. When you are using one D simulation, you are simulating years of behavior of the battery, and the two are not directly communicating. So what? What we aim at uh, in the project is to, cr to create and understand the right indicators from the DFT in order to get the right parameters from the, the continuum calculations or for the FEM calculation at the particle level and so on, and then create some uh, correlation from there using different tools, different, uh, different softwares. So the, um, among the partners of the project, we have um, University of Torino and uh, Siemens Industry Softwares. Uh, so they have their, both their, their own software that they are developing within the project. So uh, University of, of uh, Torino is uh, developing crystal code for DFT calculation of uh, active matter specifically. And uh, Siemens Industry Software is developing 1D simulation code, uh, SimCenter AmSim and uh, uh, SimCenter StarCCM+. And so there will be the main output of the project as commercial, uh, commercial uh, software. So that's uh, that they are using this uh, input and, and as uh, as also as a, as an output, they have developed a specific library for uh, Star CCM Plus in order to design batteries directly in their tools, choosing the, the it's based on what they do, they done before on the Battery Design Studio in order to uh, to design uh, and simulate batteries in 3D correctly and uh, user uh, in a user friendly manner. And regarding the, the communication between the, the scale, uh, so the, the it's not completely integrated. It's not possible to completely integrate that because it's uh, when you do DFT and so on, you need a cluster and, and very big calculation measure, uh, means. When you do one D simulation, you, you can use a regular computer, so it's it's not co completely compatible. So the aim is to have uh, specific uh, methodologies from from DFT. Once your colleagues who are uh, when the teams that are uh, used to do ab initio modeling have done the calculation, you can use and communicate. That's a big difficulty we have, and we talked about COVID. It was also uh, some uh, some uh, issue with us in order to uh, to make the, a good communication between teams. When when I talk to uh, to a colleague from ab initio, I'm not able to understand exactly what they want to say to me regarding uh, diffusion parameters that are far away from what I used to have and what I measure at the, at the test bench and so on. 
So as I said, there are some uh, improvement to be done because we scratch the surface. We have a mean to calculate uh, diffusion coefficient. We have two order of magnitude. We know that the material is not perfect, so we need to uh, to to understand how we link this uh, huge range of different coefficient with the actual uh, different coefficient we need to use in our model in uh, in uh, uh, in one D simulation, and it's still uh, it's still something that is needs needs to be done after our model is project. Thank you. There was a question from Apenzella. No, yes, there Apenzella. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> My name is Joseph Zeregel. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, really good uh, results and promising results. And my question is now, you have uh, clear at the beginning uh, treated and investigated how are the competition worldwide in this direction. And now my question is, if you are looking today uh, in this direction, uh, what do you see is a competition in US, in China, Japan, uh, uh, in, the, in the direction of research results uh, that we here in Europe, you are four uh, representatives of this one, uh, equal or higher, or we had to do a next step to reach this uh, level? That would be my question. Thank you. Reply. Someone wants to reply? <laughs> or should we can say that we, need, we are the Maybe. best in research? <laughs> okay, uh, of course, if we say this all the time, then we start to believe this, and at the end, then we think that we don't have to further, let's say, develop. I think that would be maybe a little bit dangerous to, to think that. But um, I personally think also um, uh, during, during the experience that might, since, since I'm coordinating Sublime, is basically. Um, all the research at the end needs uh, a good foundation by um, providing materials tools from the industry uh, and of course what the delivery of materials is concerned I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit repetitive or maybe on this uh, because I said this already before um, we need to keep up yeah, so because uh, all the materials that we need in order to do our um, laboratory experiments um, they should come from Europe and we should not rely on getting them from wherever the place is, uh, Asia or, or uh, see if this, um, we had delays, for example, in, in materials delivery just because of the COVID-19 pandemic and all what was uh, basically then the consequence of this. And that's something, of course, that is um, bringing us behind. But what we see, of course, that we, are, we do in terms of the other research are really are, are very on a very high level uh, and, and are really on, on the edge. But of course, is it, there is no help if you at the end then have to wait for the lab materials to continue with your research. Yep. Uh, I think I, I would have given you two different answers before and after the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, <laughs> in, the, in the time since, uh, there's uh, clearly been a lot of movement on uh, building battery uh, industry in, in the U.S. Uh, even uh, the Norwegian gigafactories uh, are starting to open uh, U.S.-based uh, uh, factories. So there, there's been a lot of movement on the industry side of things. Uh, but I think uh, in terms of research, uh, there's nothing really going on in the United States at the same level as what's being done in Europe, especially these uh, kind of large uh, flagship type projects like Battery 2030 and Big Map. Uh, they're often spoken about with some uh, enviousness, I think, uh, with uh, some of my, my American colleagues. And that's, this is something that's, that uh, I think Europe is doing really well and something that's unique in the world and uh, is, is, has given us a, a kind of competitive ad advantage in, in research at the moment. That being said, I think the, the United States has been kind of late to the party on battery research, but they're starting to show up now. So, uh, you know, just because we've done well in the past doesn't mean we can, we can uh, you know, rest easy. We need to continue uh, striving to, to be the best if we want to maintain that competitive edge. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult topic, right? <laughs> it's quite political, I think. Um, yeah, I think we should really continue to strive for excellence in research. I mean, my my f my feeling is almost a bit different than yours, Simon. I feel like that many of the most innovative works still come out of the U.S. in terms of scientific publication, right? I mean, they they all they all they have. Uh, also very very good groups I think that are working at the leading edge so I think we, we cannot uh, 
we cannot slow down. We rather have to speed up. I mean, it also happened to us a few times uh, that we get, uh, got scooped uh, because they, they are sometimes very efficient at really uh, finalizing a manuscript and, and, and bringing it out. And another aspect that I would like to discuss here is maybe the topic of IP generation. I'm also wondering if if we could put a larger emphasis maybe also from the commission on IP generation, because that's, I think, really, really important for uh, f for the European economy, right? And for European uh, companies and for our um, financial well-being, let's say, right? I mean, publications are, are probably not enough. In the end, we also really need to um, develop new IP. And from what I heard, for example, from China, is that there, I think the funding agencies are sometimes putting a larger emphasis on uh, on uh, IP generation, on patents and so on, than, than maybe here in Europe. And um, maybe, maybe that's something that um, more, more for the Commission also to to stress a bit more in, in future calls. But it, it depends, of course, a lot also on the TRL level, right? And uh, uh, I guess there's not one solution for all calls, but uh, that's that's a little bit my, my feeling. But we, we for sure have also really cutting edge uh, research infrastructure in Europe. Uh, if, if I think about beam lines, for example, I mean, for very fundamental research, I think we are very well, very well equipped. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there's also a lot of competition in the world, also from Asia, not only from the US. So I think we, yeah, we have to, uh, we have to do our best. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the competition, uh, as you said, is is uh, is really uh, important in the in the in worldwide. But uh, what we have also, is, I think, what we could rely on is the network that we have in Europe. Especially, we have all the skills needed for that. We have metal, good metal manufacturers. We have good metal providers from Europe. We have also uh, battery manufacturers, battery integrators, OEMs, and so on for a lot, a large range of applications. And all this uh, is helps us to create this uh, this collaboration that needs to be done in order to efficiently create and get the edge for for the industry. It's not just having the best material that will help us to uh, to prevail or having the best uh, integration, having the best car. We need to have the best material integrated in the best battery, integrated in the best car, and so on. And for that, you need a good collaboration between all stakeholders for for that. Just while you are thinking to next question, I want just to add that this also the, a good uh, collaboration between, uh, let me say, the European Commission and the main uh, groups working like uh, Batteries Europe, BEPA and uh, uh, Battery 2030 br brought to get these calls. So this is something that is not uh, starting from the scratch, but is a discussion, very wide discussion between people. So I really push you to be part of the expert groups uh, that are working within uh, these projects. So uh, participate and then uh, help. Uh, everyone is writing uh, this call to, to do the best and get the best uh, uh, way to get projects funded, that, not funded, this is up to <laughs> the evaluators, but uh, the calls uh, that are pushing uh, to get uh, great results in Europe, uh, first of all, <laughs> uh, and uh, reach the, and overcome the competition. Is there some further questions? Please, uh, Pietro, I'm there. The question from Pietro was missing, so. <laughs> yes, yes, I am used to, to make <laughs> questions, yes. I, I remember I was participating at the very first uh, European project on uh, on batteries in Darmstadt, uh, and uh, there was a session on nanotechnologies for uh, for batteries. Okay, and I raised up again. I, I asked a question. It says, if there is a nano wire on silicon, although I am an old physicist, theoretical physicist, I can still calculate what is the energy needed to expand this single nano wire. Okay, now um, to my friend Martin. And also, and also the other. I see here that uh, all these simulations are by mechanical mechanical engineers or engineers in general. So, uh, in my perspective, is the electrochemistry is very, very complex at a nano level. I still haven't seen haven't seen very, very nothing or very little 
First, because you never know exactly how the electrolyte is, or then, or then, or then, or then. So uh, my opinion is that there is an, uh, a need to understand the battery more at a physical level. And by the way, take the provocation. Take the provocation. I know people working for pure physical batteries. Ciao electrochemistry. Remember the, my starting point. Tell me what sort of nanowires you are using, and although I am an old theoretical physicist, I can still make some, cal some calculation on the energy needed to absorb and to release energy from a zinc nanowire. I know groups working on pure physical batteries. And I agree with what Joseph was saying. We need more knowledge at the physical level, or also at the theoretical chemistry level. To, be, to take a real advantage. Until we simulate from a pure engineering point of view, I don't see, I don't see any, any real s step that can put us in, in advantage with, with the Chinese. Martin, please excuse me if I, uh, I was working with Martin for, for a while, but we remain at a, an engineering level. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry from this point of view. I have to, to emphasize this aspect, okay? But perhaps your, your point of view, you, you are in the field more than, my, I, I'm not a, in, a, in, in the battery environment a, anymore. I'm thinking about something else. Perhaps you can contradict me and say, no, at the pure theoretical level, we, we are engaging theoretical physicists and theoretical chemists to, to better understand what, what we are doing. Perhaps please contradict me. But I don't see this in the roadmap as well. There is, a, I think, there is a, a huge gap between the expectation uh, from the people who are working with batteries and the, and the, what we can do actually, especially at the theoretical point of view, because uh, theoretical point of view gives us a lot of information on how the battery works, what what would be the best material, and so on, and you can design a material. And, but when you put it together with uh, collector, with binders, with uh, separator, with the other electrode, uh, with material that's evolving around time and so on, everything is fucked and you cannot get anything working uh, at all b b compared to what you have in theory. And that's uh, the main issue we have with theory because uh, the, uh, no, no metal is perfect. You take an MC, it's not a perfect NMC crystal that you have, and you have a diffusion from one point to another. The lithium diffusion is not from one, one part of the NMC to the other. There are different paths of diffusion with different diffusion coefficients and so on. And how do you derive a diffusion coefficient that is uh, good for using into a, into a battery in a car? when you, you don't know where the lithium comes from, where it goes, from site to site and so on. It's, it's very complicated. And that's why I said earlier, we, we just scratch this uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Modalis, for instance. We spend a lot of time to create the crystal, to create uh, crystals that are stable. When you remove cobalt, uh, my colleagues from University of Torino, uh, Gemate and, uh, and uh, CRF, uh, lost a lot of airs. If you know Mauro's Groy, uh, <laughs> he has no air at all now. But it, it was very complicated to, to do that because uh, you, you, you need to, to have bigger and bigger cells to model, and so you need bigger and bigger computational co uh, it's, uh, It has a bigger and bigger computational cost, and it has less and less representativity because it's too perfect. The material is cut, it's grinded, you have, uh, it evolves, you lose manganese, you lose particles, you have a, a CEI and so on. You have so much things that are changing your material that what you calculate by theory is completely uh, different from what you have. So, and when you talk to car manufacturers, they say, okay, we have a material, we have an MC, we have bought them from uh, Yumicor, we have bought them from, from I don't know uh, 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 which manufacturer, we put them into the battery, how does the battery work? But if you ask for your colleagues from DFT, okay, what is the material uh, manufacture, uh, the material working, how the material is working uh, if you have an MC? And they say, okay, we have uh, so much EV of uh, something working, and I don't know, but we won't be able to have uh, the, the polarization curve, you won't be able to have the voltage of your battery, you won't have, you will be able to have the resistance of your battery directly. So you need to, to find a way to close the gap. So it's a huge part of the work of Modalis and many other projects in order to create this, these bridges between the scales. It's very complicated. And also you need to find uh, 
uh, other ways to evaluate this, this, uh, these quantities. And this goes by specific experiments, of course. And you lose the theoretical chemistry from this because you need to have real parameters, real behavior, and not only theory. That's a, a big difficulty for, for the modeling part. Do you want to reply, for example, with experience of uh, big projects like Big Map or something? No. And then we, we have just one additional question and we close the session. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really good point that you bring up, actually. And I, I wouldn't say that we need, uh, you know, only uh, physics-based and really theoretically sound models. We need them in addition to the, the more engineering-related uh, related models. Because on, on the one hand, you know, there's a lot of really excellent theorists doing, you know, DFT simulations and molecular dynamics and FCI QMC and a lot of really fancy, uh, you know, theoretically grounded uh, physics-based modeling methods. And they can uh, screen a lot of materials and, you know, provide you with a lot of, of opportunities that could work. But, you know, as, as we said, as soon as you try to build it in, into a cell, it's, you know, a whole new can of worms that you're opening. So you need, on the one hand, uh, theorists to do the, the kind of screening calculations and to say, okay, this is what's possible. But then you also need the engineers to come along and say, okay, well, this is how we, we put it into a real cell. And on the other hand, you know, with, with engineers, uh, we like to fit things, you know, and John von Neumann famously said, give me five parameters and I'll fit you an elephant and give me six and I'll make him wiggle his trunk. Right, so uh, you know, fitting in empirical models helps, but also as engineers, we need to have this this uh, mindset that our models are only as valuable as the uh, as the the knowledge that they represent. They have to be grounded in physics, and they have to uh, to reflect uh, physical reality. Uh, so I, th I think it's it's a good point, and I think we need to try to do more to bring those two communities together and get the the electric chemists uh, and the engineers talking together. <coughs> maybe I would like to maybe I would like to bring another a third group into the play. So um, actually, my background is as I said, I'm a mechanical engineer. So uh, and I have lots of background experience in uh, modeling of uh, turbine combustion. Uh, and every time when I see all these uh, presentations, also within Sublime, by the way, which I didn't show, um, but I will show once uh, they have uh, completed the modeling, um, you know, that the uh, highly dimensional uh, dimensionality of the problems, they, they come very clear to the, the challenges that we had uh, when we tried to model turbulence. So it means, you know, you, you have the three dimensions, then you have the microscope, which is actually the fourth dimension. And I tell you, um, my recommendation is just talk to these guys, maybe, because they, they already have, you know, the, the tools, how to abstract things, because it's getting... A, almost uh, the same complexity as you might have uh, and they might have some other ideas and I think there, there could be lots of lots of synergies and and these things you know uh, as we know probably all these uh, models of uh, turbine combustion they might get unemployed I don't know at, at some time <laughs> but maybe they, they will find another employment because they could bring some new ideas into that and uh, uh, yeah, that could be of benefit. So uh, yeah, there are some keywords you know like flame rate theory which tried to always to reduce the dimensionality of the problem so uh, you know, always when I see these things, you know, when you try to model microscale, I thought, oh, that looks like a flamelet, whatever, yeah? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, they have some kind of these uh, tools at hand. So they're just named differently, maybe. Okay, so, uh, so I guess time is over. So I sh I'm sure that you will find additional time for question during uh, the coffee break, so a networking time. So I want to thank uh, you all maybe uh, for this very interesting uh, session. And uh, please, Johan, if you want to. Yes, just some uh, housekeeping um, for your information. So uh, you can go down for the coffee and the drink, of course, but don't forget to also visit the exhibition area mm -hmm. at the European Commission stand. You can also get in touch with the new projects that are just starting under uh, Horizon Europe also from the battery call. So it's a good opportunity to take stock of what, uh, what will be happening. I just inform you that we restart at 4.30. In this room here, we have a session on next generation electrified vehicles optimized for infrastructure. And there is a CCAM session in the Einstein room. So thank you very much once again to all of the speakers and to you for your attention. Thank you.